first, I guess, we'll just do introductions. Uh, my name is Melissa Osborne. I'm with the Peace Education Center of East Lansing. And today we have some guests and... John okay. Matthews. All right. And I work mm -hmm. for Teach for America. Okay. I'm Juliana Bradley. Um, I am an alumni of Teach for America, and I'm currently volunteering to help put on this event. Okay. And because you guys have an event coming up here at MSU, uh, January 28th, correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, can you tell me just a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's the Now More Than Ever Rally, and it's a rally for educational equity. Um, okay. So we're partnering with uh, the university's programming board, the ASMSU, uh, to put on this event, which pulls together community organizations and MSU organizations in an attempt to to raise awareness about the issue and to get people involved and finding a way to help end it. Okay. Now, so it's Teach for America that's initially behind this action. Right, and we're partnered pretty closely with the ASMSU. ASMSU uh, okay. they, they jumped on with us and wanted to get this going as soon as we let them know about it. All right. Now, is this going on anywhere else in the country, or is this just an MSU event at this time? Well, Teach for America does have a national campaign called Now More Than Ever that, they're, that they just started okay. um, in an attempt to really build some urgency around educational equity. Um, you know, with the, the Occupy movement and this talk of inequality across the board, we really understand that to address inequality, we have to address education um, and provide equal opportunity for everyone to succeed. Okay. Um, so this is actually the first rally that's being held with that theme. So it is the first of its kind, um, but it's sort of following a trend that's already happening throughout the country. Okay. Do you think that this will actually like occur elsewhere in the country once this initial action takes place? Wow, that would, that would be incredible. And <laughs> uh, I would love to see that yeah. uh, occur. Um, now, I think what uh, a good platform that we have is is that I've got a lot of other recruiters that are recruiting across the nation for Teach for America, and they're all keeping an ear to the ground to see kind of what happens with this rally and uh, what it does for raising awareness. Uh, so if it's successful, like there's there's a possibility that we'll see other schools trying okay. to to emulate it. All right. I mean, I just want a little for I guess ask a little bit about your personal feelings about educational like inequality. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think like when I first like dug into this and saw that there, there are over 16 million low-income students growing up today, half of them won't graduate high school, the half that do are, are performing on average at an 8th grade level, uh, it's kind of blown away. Um, so spending, spending a few years teaching in the Mississippi Delta, I, I, really, uh, I really saw the incredible potential of each and every one of these students and, and what we're doing right now. Uh, I've never... I've never felt more strongly about an issue that needs to be resolved in order to see to uh, see our country move move forward as a nation. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, same here. So John and I actually became friends in the Delta. We both taught in Mississippi. Okay. Uh, we were placed there by Teach for America. Um, and I, I taught eighth grade English, and the students that I started with my first year were reading on an average fourth grade level. Um, and so, wow. as, I mean, right, the implications of that are pretty strong, right? Like, they the uh you know you have to be literate to be successful you have to be able to communicate um and to to operate in the world especially with you know technology and globalization you to be competitive you really have to have those skills and so it was heartbreaking to see firsthand uh the effects of our, our broken system and so i think that's why now um no matter what we do from this point forward like we personally feel compelled to fight for educational equity to make sure that no matter what a student's racial background or socioeconomic background, that they have a chance to fulfill the purpose for which they were, they were born, you know, yeah, and that right. they, they really can be successful and, and can break the cycle of poverty that they were born into. Yeah, I think, I think you've one shot at an education and which is why like we've attached so tightly to this now more than ever, because the kids growing up today, mm -hmm. they've got one chance to make it through the system and, uh, and we want to make sure that they can do it and, they make it through like they should be able to go to college and get a degree and come back and help their families and uh, that's going to be a reality and uh, we got to get there so and how long have you both been involved with Teach for America uh, three years uh, okay. this is my first year on staff uh, okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the same I we we started Teach for America in 2009 right out of college okay um, and it's a two-year program um, you, you commit to teaching for two years and a lot of people stay in the classroom, but, uh, so this is our third year kind of being associated with it. But I, again, I'm not with Teach for America. I'm just sort of a volunteer kind of, 
uh, working to help mobilize people and, and doing a lot of the, the more communication stuff while he's kind of out there meeting with people, um, talking to college students who might want to get into Teach for America um, and trying to raise awareness from that end. Right. And is Teach for America a nonprofit organization? Yeah. Uh, okay. Teach for America is a national nonprofit, and effectively what we're doing is is finding tomorrow's leaders and giving them the proper training and support and putting them in some of our nation's highest need schools. Uh, and uh, and what you're kind of seeing with Juliana uh, is that there's a long term movement here. Is like once people finish their two year commitment, we're seeing around sixty percent actually stay within the classroom longer. Um, but it's at 40% that move on into their respective fields, whether it's medicine, journalism, public policy, whatever it is that they're passionate about, they're going into those fields and are becoming the drivers of those industries. But now they've spent two years in some of our nation's highest need schools. So they've seen the complexities of the problems our districts are facing, the challenges our students are having, and uh, no matter where they are, they're playing their own specific role from their specific sector of society impacting education. So as we fill classrooms up with some of our nation's brightest and best, most promising leaders. We've got an alumni movement of 28,000 impacting oh, education wow. from, from the outside. Um, so it's kind of our long-term theory. And so we, we're kind of like, we stick close together and everyone always is trying to, to do what they can. Uh, so Okay. And I mean, and what are some of the goals you want to see come out of this rally? I mean, do you want to just like raise awareness to some of these students, possibly recruit or like... Yeah. What, are, what are the goals? Um, you know, I, the big goal for this rally, I think, is is really getting MSU students and the community aware of not only the issue, but the students who are aware of what you can do about it. Because a lot of people see this and they say, wow, this is such a massive issue. Like, I can't, I can't play an impact on this. Uh, but I want people to come to this rally, uh, be enlightened about some of the, the, the disheartening statistics but then empowered because we've got all these organizations coming to the rally that they're going to be able to talk with and communicate with at the pause for the cause, which is happening after we have some great speakers um, in Wells Hall. They're going to be able to talk with, with organizations like OCAT, uh, which is the Office of uh, Cultural Academic Transitions, and it's helping students who, who are coming into college like transition from high school into college and giving them the support networks that, that they need. Um, so there's so many... So many great organizations that are going to be there, uh, and we really want to uh, see people get involved that way. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, in Michigan, like, I didn't know if there is, like, a, a specific reason why you're in Michigan, but, you know, with our recent major cuts in education at the, you know, just at the expense of businesses, you know, getting a tax break, you know, I wasn't sure if there was any reason why yeah. you would choose Michigan or if it was just something that just kind of happened by chance that yeah. you were here. Uh, so the way I was placed here was uh, actually through Teach for America. And so like my role is a recruiter. So at the end of the day, like, uh, like Teach for America will have a stand at the rally. And uh, I hope like some people say, like, yeah, like this is the route that I want to take and I want to apply to this organization. Um, but uh, I was placed here to, to actually recruit and talk with students at Michigan State, Kalamazoo and Western Michigan about educational inequality. And I found that there was, uh, there was not as big of an awareness as I wanted there to be. And uh, I thought one of the best ways to do that is to, to try and pull the campus together. Um, okay. So it was kind of by chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, mean, in, I mean, there's just so much going on in Michigan where it's, right. you know, we're just losing our basic public systems and our right. infrastructure. I mean, it's, the state's been in trouble for a long time, but it's it's been particularly bad, you know. Right. And right. Even now, like they're talking about breaking teacher unions and things of that nature. So I I wasn't sure if there was like an an actual like reason for being here, but it is nice that it's just kind of like happened, you know. Right. It's just like there was an awareness, so it just kind of like blossomed on its own because now you know we will have people that understand that how important education really is. You know, we're losing it. Right. Here, you know, a lot of talk about Detroit schools. Mm -hmm. And having an emergency financial manager, I know. You know, it's just we get national attention. For right, it's, it's definitely district. it's definitely a spot where I mean I think all eyes are on Michigan right now in the state of of education and and what what was going to happen and what are what are we doing because I think it's I mean it's watching Detroit and seeing what's happening in Detroit. It's, it's been kind of a fascinating ride over this past year just being here because that's really when I've really tuned in to what's happening and uh, seeing emergency superintendents brought in and what they're doing. And, it's going to be interesting. I think people are, are going to see what's happening and if it works and if it doesn't. Uh, and 
crossing my fingers and hoping that yeah. that we take things on the right path. <laughs> yeah, uh, it might be a good first step. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I mean, what other organizations beyond MSU are involved in this right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've engaged as many community groups as possible. So we've talked to Mich- Michigan Education Association. We're hoping to yeah. have as a table. Um, they're not confirmed. Um, but, you know, because we... We don't want people to think that this event is purely a recruitment tool for Teach for America because it's not that. I mean, certainly it came out of us being in Teach for America, but we more than that, we want it to sort of mirror the the uh, the complexity of the problem. We want people who are coming at it from a lot of different perspectives um, who are strengthening low income communities in some way to be there. And so um, we've also who else is coming? The the AUSL, um, which is. I don't want to to butcher their name, just throwing it off the top of my head, but it's the Urban School Leadership uh, Academy, and effectively what they do is they step into schools and, and help bring in a strong administration and uh, help help turn schools around. I think that they're picking up nine new schools this year. Okay. Uh, they currently have 16 schools that they're working with, uh, so they're going to be coming to the, to the rally, and actually uh, one of their leaders of their organization will be speaking at the rally as well, uh, Tasha Downs. Okay. Yeah. No, it's good. I mean, actually, I was curious if it was a recruitment thing myself or if it's just something right. about information and, and exactly. awareness. Exactly, because, you know, and you were asking why, you know, why Michigan, but Mich- the problems in Michigan really are indicative of the problems everywhere. Yeah. There is, yes, there's are. not a state in this country that isn't facing budget cuts, you know, um, that, that are disproportionately affecting low-income communities. Um, almost every state has, is having issues with education. So, yeah, so, you know, this is a place where there is a great room for change. There's a lot of people pushing for change. Um, and so even though, and so and it did, it sort of organically arose from, from this lack of awareness. And I think that if people can just, uh, we can just build some energy around it and, and, right. and, 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 and make people see that if we're going to fix inequality, if we're going to, um, you know, y- use our resources wisely, like we need to start with education. You know, we need to make sure that every kid is able to fulfill again fulfill that purpose for which they they exist and so um i i there while i I had one person tell me well like your goals they're they're kind of amorphous they're not really clear but it's not you know we're not we're not demanding um results from a particular place there you know the the problem itself is amorphous we just want to raise awareness of it and make more people understand that this isn't this isn't something that affects an others. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not like, it's not the people across the, the, you know, across town that are being affected. This is everyone. And this is, um, this is a collective problem that we all need, that we all have a stake in and all need to be working and doing at least something to, to fix. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the more people that are educated, you know, the more people that can actually participate in the economy right. as it right. changes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But, you know, and I, um, and it, you know, just thinking about, how people just seem so unaware. I'm wondering how much misinformation about why schools are bad you run into. Like, do you ever find that these people grew up so sheltered in a good school that they somehow find fault with either the students or like the administration mm-hmm. or the school district itself? Like, it, like people will believe in the state that the reason why Detroit is bad is because they just mismanaged their funds. They didn't realize that the tax base fell out from underneath them, you know, or that there is in like just an inequality about how state resources are divided up in the state. You know, I mean, they just, they don't understand like systemic problems that are not at the fault of the people. But how often do you run into that, particularly in college students? You know, uh, I, I get to sit down and talk with a lot of students. Uh, and I think what's, what's really great is that every student that I've sat down with, like literally everyone, when I break down the issue, I give them the numbers. I let them know like how they're performing compared to higher income peers uh, everyone says, wow, like this is an issue. Um, they understand the gravity, they get it. Um, and I think that I was actually expecting like more pushback there. I was expecting I'd really have to be getting people invested in this issue. But the biggest thing is I found was like just letting them know about it. Um, so I think there's unawareness because okay. of this sheltered, uh, kind of like growing up in, in either a higher income school, like myself, uh, I went to a public school in Texas, but it was uh, it was middle, like a middle to upper income school, and I was unaware of educational inequality until I was in college, and I was a junior in college, uh, and I got to volunteer with with low income students. Uh, uh, I did lots of fun stuff with them, but but the one thing I saw was that how far behind they were, and that's what initially got me to dig into this, and so I think it was like kind of that spark and. 
And the fact that I get to act as that spark for so many people uh, is empowering to myself. And uh, I, I love empowering people with that knowledge because as soon as they figure out what's going on, they they want to drive forward with it. Um, but I think as to your point of what you're saying, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding. I think it, especially when people get older um, and they look look towards these issues, uh, they seem to to simplify them uh, because it's so complex, uh, as you're saying, like tax bases falling out, school funds being tied to property taxes, so many so many issues that the more you dive in, uh, the deeper it gets. Um, so it's definitely not a simple problem to solve, but uh, it's one that if we get minds working on it, we're going to. Yeah, I mean, I had a professor once that went to Detroit Public Schools, and he would have to explain to our classes, and we were in a sociology class, there is a difference when you go, when he went to U of M, mm -hmm. where he was competing with students that had calculus classes in high school, and it was just easy. And for him, there was like nothing of this kind. Yeah. So for him, he's walking in just completely unprepared mm -hmm. and had no idea. Like, he just had no idea what was offered to anyone else. Mm -hmm. He yeah. still did very well. I mean, yeah. he finished with a graduate degree, obviously, and he teaches at MSU now. But that's where I'm wondering, like, where a misunderstanding might happen. Yeah. Or just, you know, like, not even just like well like a misinformation or they believe yeah. something mm -hmm. without a real cause or yeah mm -hmm. just typical unawareness he was unaware of how bad his situation was yeah. Yeah. but I, th I think there is um maybe not you know on the individual level like you said like students initially younger people there i think they see that there is a systemic problem but i think there is a cultural dialogue that we hear where it's like blame the parents or yeah, blame right. the students themselves. And, you know, even recently I know that there was kind of um, some controversy because this article came out where a writer said, well, if I was a young black kid, this was a, this is what I would do, right? And he was a he was a he was a well-educated white man, and and it and it made people say like that's absurd. And and I even felt I I was I I could understand because you know when I think about the students that I taught in Mississippi, I had some kids that were incredibly brilliant. And I mean, I had one student who she read on a above a 12th grade level in eighth grade, and she was just mind blowingly smart. And yet the school itself didn't offer a math class above algebra two. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't offer AP classes, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't. And so she, she can be brilliant and she can work as hard as she possibly can and still will not be ready for a rigorous university setting yeah. when she's done with high school. And I think that that is exactly what we're seeing across the nation. You know, that they're, that, that they're, it's the school system, it's the, it's the lack of um, rigorous college readiness, um, mm -hmm. you know, curriculum, it, you know, um, teachers who put kids on a path to college um, and who and who are teachers who aren't giving the re, being given the resources to do so, you know. So there's there's a lot of problems involved, but I and I think that there we, we definitely need to get away from from the dialogue of blaming the mm -hmm. kids and blaming families and look more at like what can we do to fix this and um, yeah. and 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 I think that's why you know that's why we wanted to do this rally as well is, and just like and you know we want people to be aware of the problems, but we want them more than anything to be to want to do something about it exactly um, because yeah. there are so many things that can be done whether that's like donate school supplies to a low-income school or go tutor a kid after school every day um or um you know just call up a school and say hey like how can i volunteer do you need any help there are so many little things that can be done um, and then there's also like the big picture things like if you want to go into advocacy and policy um, I'm actually going into social work because of the, the conditions that I saw because you know my kids did come from homes that were a lot more difficult so you know it's it's a it's a it's a systemic problem it's not something that should be blamed on individuals but I think every individual should have a stake in wanting to make it better because oh, yeah. it's amazing like those are the kids that when they do get to college understand the inequality oh, yeah, immediately Absolutely. but because they're so unprepared they're not the ones that are usually the most successful getting through right yeah well, I think what we see is like in higher income areas there's around 8 out of 10 students who will by the time they're 25 have a college degree low income areas a little less than one out of ten, uh, and that just highlights it right there. Cause, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I as a, as a teaching assistant in MSU, we taught online classes that had off-site exams, and we went to Beverly Hills, Michigan. And when I walked in the school, they had like posters on the wall of the one hundred books you should read before entering college. I had never seen anything like that because I grew up in a, like a lower middle class area of Michigan, and my school had nothing like this. And I mean, you could just see where yeah. these kids are already groomed 
to succeed. Right. The expectations are different. Yeah. Right. Based yeah. on money. That's yeah, we it's, need to break it's, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where I didn't think my school was a poor school, uh, a failing school per se, but right. it definitely was not one that prepared kids for college. Mm-hmm. And to yeah. see this just as a college student myself and walking in, I'm like, I can't believe like the money some of these schools have. I mean, flat screen TVs right. and like computers everywhere. These kids were ready. But how do we make it so every kid is ready? I mean, it's it's a big deal. Right. I mean, I walk into schools like elsewhere, like my kids when they went to a DC public school. Mm-hmm. The only reason why they had a library is the parents got a grant from Toyota. Hmm. Other than before that, they really didn't have a functioning wow. library. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just bizarre to see how starkly different it really can be. Yeah, exactly. yeah, absolutely. And I think like there there are some really cool proof points that are that are happening across across the nation right now that we can like look to and and look to for models of success and like what we should be doing with our schools uh one of which is kip uh kip academy uh which is knowledge is power um and it was actually started by two tfa alum and uh they are charter school but uh i'll take a minute to say like not all charter schools are the answer because some charter schools which aren't doing so well uh but it's all about the culture they create and the high expectations they give their students and, and how they communicate uh, with parents and get them involved with the school. Um, when you walk into a KIPP school, you can feel the energy. It's, it is a, a place where you walk in and you know it's time to learn. You've got kids who know when they're going to graduate from college. They know that year they're graduating. They, uh, they have their cell phone, the teacher's cell phone, and they can call them like on the weekends. They have school on Saturday. They work like through the summer. Uh, these kids are like doing everything it takes because it's not about a quality of inputs into our school system. It's about a quality of output. Um, and we know every single one of these kids have the ability to achieve. And it's like, we got to figure out what it takes to do it. Uh, so the KIPP school is a, is a really cool thing to look to, uh, to kind of like see what we're doing and seeing like incredible success. Yeah. And now it's how do we get that into public schools That's as right. well? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely possible. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Citizens United is another really cool program that's uh, actually I was just talking with uh, yesterday, and um, what they're doing is is they're they're transferring like taking the the successful aspects of the KIPP and the successful charter schools, and they're bringing them to public schools by by bringing in almost a second shift of teachers, and uh, they work with students uh, like after the bell rings, like students like the buses don't leave until Citizens United leave, which is about three hours after a. a the regular school day ends and they're there for tutoring and helping them with one-on-one uh, management and kind of like setting those big goals and getting them ready for college and getting them pumped up about it and it, they're seeing a lot of success right now and they're they're talking about expanding to Michigan uh, which is pretty cool so oh, wow yeah I mean it's amazing you had mentioned that there's um, a group at MS are uh, participating in your rally and that's also a group at the university that helps like integrate kids is that what, like or like as they come so, in from yeah. high school uh, so what it is is it's um basically what they have are the ocad aides and they work with students who um they, it's kind of a it's pretty broad who they work with the students who have uh, transferred in who come from low-income areas or multicultural students and uh they act as aides and they help them out make sure they know what resources they can have access to 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 help them succeed um get them study hours uh really are there to support them in their first few years of college and helping them with that transition uh, to make sure they're ready to go and they know they know how to succeed. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredible organization. Uh, they're doing incredible things, and they're, they're actually a very big supporter of the rally. Right. So. so it's good to just know that because we were just talking about these kids, even the ones that want to be college ready, coming out of these schools. But it's good to know that supports like this exist because... As long as inequality exists, we need that extra yeah. help. So yeah, they need to be augmented, but they do exist on on some on some level, which is important. Yeah, well, I mean, this has been great. I mean, if, yeah. is, is there anything else that you'd like to add about this rally before uh, we wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, if if anyone who's listening or is on the web uh, watching <laughs> this, uh, if you want to join, this is for everyone, not just MSU students. So we're meeting at Beaumont Tower on MSU's campus at one thirty. Uh, on January 28th, so, so this Saturday, we're marching to Wells Hall, we're listening to some awesome speakers, and then you're going to have a chance to, to see organizations like OCAT, um, or hopefully the Michigan Education Association, and several, several others, so uh, so come out, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, Thank both you. of you. Thanks so much. It was great speaking with you. Yes, thanks.